Everybody. Everybody have a good night. Anybody go to the water park last night? No water park people here? Come on. You're staying at the Kalahari. Well, yesterday, I don't know how many people were involved with my presentation yesterday, and there was some, uh, some jokes and things going on. And uh, actually, I was going to open up today with a joke. And I did some research and looked around on the internet, Googled like, you know, some funny jokes about 3D printing, and I just kept coming up with nothing. I was thinking, like, oh, what happens when a maker bot walks into a bar with it? Nothing. Um, what, what, I, what I found is that there, there are no jokes about 3D printing. This is very serious stuff. No jokes. No jokes. All right, here we go. So um, there's been a lot of time spent talking about the different technologies, the different materials, um, the things involved with uh, 3D printing. And there's typically not a whole lot of time spent with post-processing. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to uh, share some of our experiences with post-processing and uh, kind of let everybody know what's really involved with uh, creating parts. And it's not just simply taking a part, putting it onto a printer, hitting the button, and off comes a part. So uh, we're going to spend some time going through that. One thing is that the stuff I'm presenting is just basically the basic needs of getting a part off of a printer and being able to be handled. On our display out front, there's a lot of parts with post-finishing work painting, plating, all different sorts of things. None of this is even touching that type of work. This is just basic needs, what you need, what you need to do, and how you have to handle parts. So here we go. Again, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, Protocam is a industrial 3D printing service bureau. We're in Allentown, uh, just an hour south of here. This is our facility. Um, we specialize in, in uh, industrial 3D printing. These are the four main categories that we focus on, and uh, these are the areas I'm going to cover today in terms of the post-processing work. 
Uh, some other services that we do beyond just 3D printing, uh, we do some CAD modeling design services. We also have some uh, light reverse engineering, laser scanning. We have a big RTV molding department, um, like Bob talked this morning. Uh, that was a big part of the industry, and we still uh, continue to do that. It's a, it's a good portion of our business, and that's why we still uh, favor stereolithography as our, our uh, method of choice. We also do wax patterns. It's a very similar process to the RTV molding. Instead of injecting urethane inside of the molds, we put wax into the mold. We have wax casters. We have Renishaw vacuum casters. Um, a lot of different equipment uh, dedicated to that. Um, again, quick cast patterns and then sand and plaster cast patterns. So I thought at this time I'd take you for a little virtual tour through, uh, through Protocam. Um, feeling kind of like little Mr. Rogers-ish right now, but I'm not going to take my shoes off, don't worry. Um, this is the entryway coming into our facility. Um, this is our office space. Apparently nobody was working this day, and uh, everybody cleaned up pretty good. There's like nothing on any desk. It's amazing. I don't know what happened. Um, there's, th this is just as much as I could capture. There's a whole other side over here um, to our office space area. You know, some of our 3D printing spaces. Uh, this is our SLA room. I don't know if you can see this, these slides that good. I don't know if this front line of lights might be a good idea to get them off, but uh, I'm not sure if anybody could help with that. Or... So this is, this is the, one of our printer spaces. These are two iPro 8000s. Um, there you go. And uh, these are large frame systems, 29 and a half by 25 and a half build envelopes. Again, another room, another space um, dedicated to our polyjet technology. And we have some FDMs in this room as well. I did not have that picture. Um, but then, uh, then, then we get into our post-processing area. So you can start to take a look at um, what's going on there. Um, this, is a, this is a big area in, in our operation. Uh, this is from one end, and uh, this would be a view from the other end, um, just to show what's going on in there. There's, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of stuff going on in there, and it's important to, to show this, um, the demographics of our facility, because again, when we start talking about what's needed for post-processing, out of a 15,000 square foot facility, 5,000 of that is dedicated to office space, administrative, and the 3D printers themselves. Additional 10,000 square foot is dedicated strictly to post-processing. So that's the kind of, uh, and, and this is not a, a scare factor or anything, um, trying to persuade people away from this, but it, again, it's just a, a reality to it. There, there is um, a lot that goes into post-processing. This area is, um, you know, it's where the magic happens. We've got a lot of wizards going on and working back there. It's <laughs> kind of Harry Potter-ish. It's really cool when you go through the back doors. It's funny because when people come in and, and they, for the first time, they go through a tour, they look at the facility, they see the printers, they get excited. When we go through another set of doors and head back into our post-processing area, they get even more excited. I mean, their eyes open up, they go, oh my God, I didn't know all this was here, I didn't know all this was required, and um, it's, it's really a big eye-opener for a lot of people. Um, again, I'm just going to get into um, you know, some of the different technologies, and I'm going to go through the flow from start to finish, um, from building all the way to finished product. So again, we're going to talk first with stereolithography. I think we went over the process enough over the last two days, so I'm not going to bore you with that. Um, so this is the first stage when the parts come off of a printer. When they're built, this is what they look like. They're on a platen. They have supports associated with them. The only thing missing from this is that they would be dripping wet with resin. When they come up out of that vat, they're actually dripping with resin. And that's the first phase of what has to be done. We have to take those parts, and this is a cart. This cart is literally this tall, goes out this wide, and it actually loads right into the machine. When the parts are done, they rise up out of the vat and they sit there and drip. Now we leave them sit there and drip um, you know, as long as we possibly can before we have to start the next run. Hopefully we have to get them off of there right away. But if we have the time, we allow them to sit there because in essence they're still a little bit green. 
Um, they're still energized. So we want them to cure up as much as possible uh, before we remove them. And we take the cart, we load it into the machine, pull it out. From there, it goes into these, uh, they're called a Ramco system. And these systems, again, these are larger than a dishwasher. They're probably this high, maybe this wide a piece. We have two of them together. So just taking a look at the square footage of what that takes up, what space that takes. And then to get the card in there, so you take this, you put the platen right in the machine, the door closes, there's a solution in there, there's a variety of different solutions that are out there, TPM, Polyflush, uh, we found one that we seem to like, Green Clean, um, and it's more, it's supposed to be more uh, user friendly and, and better for the environment. Um, I think Bob has tried it but wasn't a fan of it, um, but uh, you know, to each their own. Um, so the first thing we do is, and, and we leave the parts on the platen when we run them through this tank. It's like a big, big uh, dishwashing machine. It takes it, it oscillates it, there's jets in there, and it really just tries to remove this excess resin because this excess resin is, is still UV curable. If I don't get that resin off of there, and I take these parts and I put, position them over by that window, and any UV light coming in will start to cure that resin. And like Bob had mentioned in his keynote, um, Part of your, your part quality has a lot to do with your post-processing. If you don't get that resin off, it's still in the deep pockets. If you leave it in solution too long, it will warp thin areas. So there's a lot of things you need to be concerned about. Um, and it's not all a, a standardized rule. Not every part goes into this tank for 20 minutes and it's done. If it's a big part, it may have to go longer. If it's a very small thin wall part, it may need to get out a lot sooner. Um, we have smaller tanks with ultrasonics set up. Um, again, now don't get distracted by that handsome guy up there, but when the parts come off, they're the supports below that part, and they need to be removed. And that's not done um, by dissolving, that's not done by the wizards, that's done by people. And um, our shop guys spend a lot of time removing supports. This is another example of the supports. I have some physical examples uh, up here, and you guys can take a look at them either here or at our booth later. Um, I'll allow you, you could poke these off, you can see what this is all about. Um, for each of the different technologies, um, you can play around with these. But any down-facing surface has to be supported. As the part's building, it's not just floating in midair, it's not floating on the bath, the bath of resin. It needs to be uh, supported during the build. Through SLA, the supports are on the bottom. When you start looking at consumer level SLA systems, it's, it's flipped, it's upside down. And the supports, well, I guess they're still on the bottom of the part, but it's upside down. And that is not to support, you know, this way we're supporting the part during the build, this way they're holding it so it doesn't fall off uh, in, the, in the consumer level systems. So again, just some images showing, you know, us removing all the parts. Sometimes the parts are as small as the supports. The guys start working on this. I mean, they have eye loops, they have tweezers, um, some large parts like you've seen prior, very simple to distinguish, very easy to remove. But when you're cutting into, especially in the connector world, um, sometimes it's hard to differentiate what is part here, what is support here. And they are the same color because they're built at the same time in the same bath. So there's no color differentiation. So once the parts come off, we remove all the supports, then they have to go into a post-cure UV oven. So the parts are not fully done at this point. And what we're trying to do here is make sure that they are fully cured before they would get into a customer's hands. Um, if, for instance, a little pocket, there was some still wet resin in there that we maybe didn't get at, couldn't find. We throw it in this oven to try to make sure everything is completely cured before it would leave our facility. Um, this, this UV post cure oven, this is probably two double wide refrigerators together. That's the size of this. Because we're building platforms that are 29, you know, almost 30 inches. So that 30 inch space has to fit in that table and then the unit passed it. Um, so again, this is a, a big piece of equipment. We also do a lot of work with um, you know, handheld UV curable stations because, uh, for instance, the quick cast patterns. When we're creating a quick cast pattern, one thing we do is we put vents 
and drains in the part before it builds. And the purpose of this is that when it comes up, this has that honeycomb structure. Remember the bee? Has this honeycomb structure in there. And when it comes up, we want all that resin to run out of the part. And we want to, we want to recapture that resin. So we leave it in the machine and we allow the resin to drain completely out of the part before we remove it. Now we have two holes in the part, which is bad for investment casting. They don't want to take this part, dip it into ceramic, and get ceramic inside of the pattern, or it destroys it. So now we have to fill those holes. We have to fill those vents, those um, drains. Sometimes we add more if it's not draining properly. So we have to go back and, clean and, and, and repair this stuff. So we don't put it back in the machine to do that. We have handheld, so we're, we're, we're like personal SLA machines. This unit here, there's specific glues and uh, UV curable glues that we use to fill these uh, spaces. And um, we've actually taken this machine during builds where we were having build failures during the build and tried to save them. So areas as the sweeping, we see a little delamination going on. Maybe it's a 50 hour build, we're 40 hours into it. Uh, we don't want to have to sacrifice this build. So maybe what we're going to say is, well, one area of this part is probably going to look a little ugly, but in post-processing, we'll try to fix it. So we'll pause the machine, open the doors, grab this unit, go in there, turn it on, and start just curing the resin, curing it and curing it, hoping that it adheres, and then when we restart, the next layer adheres and we have no issues. Um, it's not the best thing in the world to have to do. Um, and it's not something I enjoy doing at all, but hey, desperate, desperate times call for desperate measures. And then last but not least through the SLA phase is um, just the hand finishing. You know, once we remove those supports, there's little, we call them support nubbins on the part. Every part has these little dots that are on there and we remove them. We sand every part and remove all supports. Um, so that when you get apart, it doesn't look like something that is for Braille, um, you know, learning how to, to read. Um, so there's a lot of handwork that goes into this. And our shop guys, we have a whole shop full of workers, and they sit there and they take the parts and try to determine where those supports were, because this guy removed them. Now they go to this level, and they're sanding and finishing. So you can just get a feel for SLA, what's involved with that, all the steps taken, all the, all the secondary equipment that goes into it. Uh, we also do a lot of seal coating, especially for quick cast patterns. Again, once we're done with them, we clear coat them with a, um, a polyurethane clear coat that seals it. Just to make sure, again, any pinholes in a quick cast is detrimental to an investment cast foundry. If any slurry gets in there, it destroys it, it wastes a lot of time, a lot of processing time, and it's not a good thing. So we clear coat and seal every quick cast that leaves our facility. So we have to have the facilities to do that as well. And this is not a, out of a spray can. This is a, in a, an automotive air, air gun system, two-part system, and um, you know, something that really takes a lot of investment. And then typically on our standard parts, we bead blast them. So again, we have um, you know, an array of uh, bead blasting equipment uh, with different media in it. And the reason why we do this is more or less just to give parts a, a consistent uniform finish. Um, there's different finish levels that we offer. Some of our clients say, hey, I don't want any of my parts bead blasted uh, because I really want to see the crisp edges. I really want to see the detail. I want to know what's there. And I don't want your guys going too heavy sanding, and I don't want bead blasting to round edges or do anything more to the part. Some people, that's not important to them. Just give me something that looks nice, nice consistent finish that I can present and show somebody. Um, and 90%. Well, maybe not 90. Actually, the natural finish where we don't bead blast is actually becoming more popular as we go here. Um, so I'd say probably 60% of the parts, every one of them are bead blasted. So that's stereolithography. And like I said, I have some parts up here. You guys can take a look at it. And uh, we can talk more about it afterwards if anybody's interested. So the next one we'll go on to is selective laser sintering. Again, the process is a powdered nylon. A laser is fusing the material together, building it one layer at a time. This is a sample of a build tray. So with all the other technologies, it's a single array. Parts are stationed in one 
surface area. SLS, you can stack, you can orient, you can position parts within a certain box. So you can put lots of parts in there. Now, in this view, it looks really cool. Pretty straightforward, right? There's all your parts. You got red ones, green ones, blue ones. But imagine all these parts inside of a powder cake when the build is done. You don't see any of those parts. All you see is a cake of powder. And now it's your job to break down that cake and find all the parts. Where are they within the cake? And again, this is, a, this is something that not a lot of people know about. This is something that people take for granted. Oh, I order SLS parts. Sure, make me one. That's no big deal. Um, this gets challenging when you're dealing with parts of different sizes. What if you're dealing with a part that's only half an inch by half an inch, and you're dealing with a cake that's 30 by 30 by, where's that half of an inch part? So a lot of times what people do is we'll build a cage around the part. So that protects the part, and it allows us to have something more tangible that we can find. And then we just destroy the cage and throw it away. Because it makes it easier to find these things. It's a scavenger hunt. They're all the same color. They're all the same coming out of the same powder. There's no colors. There's nothing to look for other than feeling for parts. And again, before this even begins, we have to understand that when we build parts in, in SLS, for every hour of build time, there's an hour of cool down time. So this cake needs to be nice and cooled down before we go breaking it apart. If you take it apart too early, your parts are going to warp, distort, you can have all sorts of issues. So it's important to make sure that this cool down time is, is, is given um, prior to this breakout. Again, the breakout station, you know, these are stations where they're large tables with areas where you can push the powder and it goes back down for recycle. We have exhaust hoods. This powder is in the air. You're breathing it. We're taking exhaust uh, hoods, letting it go up in there as much as possible. Operators are wearing respirators. Um, this is not a, uh, a user-friendly technology in terms of post-processing. I mean, it creates some amazing parts. It has some real advantages, but it, it's, it's more of an investment. And yesterday I was explaining when companies go out and they start looking at different technologies, what one are we going to invest in? Sometimes in SLS might really shine, but when it falls apart is when they start realizing what goes into the post-processing. They start going, oh, oh, powders. Oh, this is going to get all over the place. We need to have this. And we need to do that. And, uh, I don't know about that. Let, let, let's go with FDM. FDM, we take a canister, plug it in, away it goes. Um, and I'm not trying to minimize FDM by any means. Um, it's just a, a more user-friendly technology from a bird's eye view. Once that powder is broken apart, now we're going to take that powder and we want to recycle it. Some percentage of that powder is reused. Some of that powder has to be thrown away. So a lot of the OEMs that sell the machines, they're going to tell you you're going to get these real high ratios, you're going to be able to recycle 50% of the powder. Anybody who does this knows that doesn't work. The more you incorporate this, because you have to imagine when this stuff's cooked, it's already been baked almost once. It's sitting in this heated box. It's getting real close to the TG where it wants to melt. So it's already been put through this process, this thermal cycle. And when it breaks down, some of those properties are not where they need to be. When it's close to the laser, it's getting affected. So we need to make sure that we, we, you just don't reuse that. It has to be um, analyzed and figured out as to what level we're going to put back. Typically, it's around 20%. 3D Systems introduced a brand new machine uh, just this year, the, the Pro X500. And this system, when they introduced it, they were trying to, you know, cover all of these areas of the post-processing because it's a big issue. So they said, well, we're going to do this. It's going to be automatically recycled material. It's going to be um, breakout station that uh, 
takes all of the material you put it on here and it there's all, all around the perimeter here is these um, exhausts and where the material can fall down into and then over here on the, on the left side there's some controls and that's where you load your material so you load material in there the machine automatically takes this material that you've already pushed down into it and starts to recycle it and starts to figure out those ratios for you and then it delivers it right back to the machine so there's no person with a bucket I mean these are in five gallon buckets that you're taking it and you're filling up filling up the machine um, this is all handled by the system now I think with anything it's if it's too good to be true it probably is and um, some of the feedback that I've heard on these machines so far has not been that wonderful number one this system here only runs with PA one resin one material you wouldn't want to do a material change out on here because think about all the things that now are associated with a material change out the, the delivery now the recycling um, everything but the hoses that they're sending the material back in is like a half inch diameter hose how long is it going to take for that to get clogged up then there then there, then you can dial in your settings for the recycling amount and it's a good thing because if it went with the 50 percent like they say it's going to you'd have a lot of build failures so what we're finding is that now it's not 50 percent even on this new system with this new um, thermal scanning that they're doing it's still not and then once again once these parts are done they're broken out of the cake they've had time to cure there's still levels of material that are stuck to the part there's still small amounts that are in crevices in corners things like that that you know you need to work at to get it out because that cured resin was here the uncured resin was here but it did get a little bit of energy there and it did start to bond to the part slightly in certain areas so each part then typically goes through a post-processing of a you know bead blasting media blast so once again when we're all done take every part run it through the media blaster and that's uh, that's a completed cycle on on SLS. Okay, now we're going to get into FDM. So we've talked a lot about FDM over the last two days. Fused deposition modeling. It's the uh, the extruder system extrudes the material down layer by layer. This is a sample build tray, again off of a large frame industrial machine. You can see. The supports associated with the parts underneath. Um, this is done on a uh, uh, on a, a film, so the film is vacuumed down into the chamber. The work is done on that, comes off, and then these parts are snapped off of the film. This is a sample FDM build here, and the nice thing about FDM is we have a lot of different colors and things that we can choose from. So I built this up on our U print. And just to show you the difference between the blue is the, is the part that we're after and the white is the support that's associated with that. So this material here happens to be ABS. Good thing about ABS is that in the systems, ABS comes with a soluble support structure. So I can take that tray, put it into, uh, th there's a, I don't think I have a picture of it. Well, this is, this is a, the U-print has a smaller frame uh, uh, soluble system. The larger frame machines have bigger units. Uh, so this is probably for a 450 or a 400. And this thing, again, is probably you know, half about this, this, this big. It's full of a solution. That solution has some level of sodium hydroxide in it. It comes from the manufacturer. You put it into here. You put your part into here and it goes through this agitation. There's heat and agitation and it will go through it and cycle for a certain amount of time. It could be four hours that it has to be in there. It could be longer. Um, sometimes it's easier just to remove the part that supports manually. You don't even have to go through this process. Um, but in instances with some geometries that are difficult, difficult to get at, difficult areas this really lends itself nice I mean having soluble supports is really a nice thing I mean I, I look for the day when SLA has soluble supports I look for the day when polyjet has soluble supports so I, and, and they are they they're actually there right now um, 
we're actually going to be testing them real soon. Um, but the soluble supports really lends itself uh, to, to something good. Um, unlike SLS, that has no supports in essence, but you see what's involved with that. So there's always trade-offs. You know, what's easier for me? What's worse for me? What material do I need versus, you know, what process do I need? So in FDM, there's a lot of other materials aside from ABS. You know, your higher engineered resins, your polycarbonates, your Oltems, your nylon. All those materials have supports too, but unfortunately they do not have soluble supports that are associated with them. So now a user has to go through and actually break them off the part. Again, this can be a real fun task, real fun task. Um, you know, some of these are, especially like your old Thames, this stuff's on there pretty good. It's on there pretty hard. And, uh, you know, our guys, I mean, these, our guys would do really good in prison because they come up, they make some tools and some stuff that you just can't imagine. I mean, there's, there's no store, there's no store to go to to say, hey, I need a, uh, an FDM part removal tool kit. Um, give me two of them because I just hired two new guys. Nope, when a new guy comes in, the old guy goes, hey, Hey, here, you need one of these. Hold on. He goes over, comes back here. You need one of these. I'll get it off real easy. Uh, so our guys are constantly with Dremel tools. Every time they go to a store, and we encourage them all the time, hey, if you guys are out, you're at a hardware store, you're, you're at Harbor Freight. I mean, we don't like Harbor Freight because the stuff's not very good quality, but, <laughs> you know, if, wherever you are, you see something that will make your job easier, buy it. I don't care what the cost is. Well, to some degree. But buy it, because there's no rules here. There's nobody to go to that says, hey, this is what you buy. You go to Stratasys, they don't have a kit. They don't have anything. They say, good luck. Yeah, this stuff's hard to get off. Good luck with that. <laughs> and they send you on your way. And um, you, know, you learn this stuff through experience. You learn the tricks of the trade. The guys in our shop, I joked around earlier by calling them wizards. but. They really are. I mean, these guys are amazing at what they do. Um, the stuff that they do every day, I mean, I don't know how they do it, but they're good. And, and, and they, they make some really cool, like I said, they, they do good in, in prison. Hopefully none of them have to go there, but <laughs> they do pretty good. Um, so PolyJet, I'm going to go on to PolyJet and what's involved with this technology and the post-processing. Um, again, this is a jetted technology. It's jetting a photopolymer. The nice thing about this technology versus SLA, I mean, they're both using photopolymers. SLA's more in the epoxy level based resins. Polyjet is still in that acrylate based resin. Um, but when these parts are jetted and that light source is following the build, they're cured fully, 100%. They're not sitting in a liquid bath. They don't have any other UV ovens to go into afterwards. When they're done printing, they're done, aside from support removal. When you start taking a look at PolyJet, I mean, again, you're going to see tools in here that are typical. You know, this is, a, this is a, a drywall scraper. I mean, this is how we get the parts off the trays. When they're built, they're stuck down onto the tray. You take scrapers and you scrape them up. That's step one. Once you get the part off, there's still remnants of support material that's on there. It's a very, very fine coating. And you almost have to use a razor blade to get that off. That needs to come off next. Um, and once that comes off, now you have parts. There's two modes of building parts in PolyJet. There's a gloss mode and there's a matte mode. And what that means is matte mode will completely cover your part in supports everywhere. The top, the bottom, inside, outside, every surface gets covered with supports. Now you would think, why would you ever want to do that? Why would, why would I want to cover my entire part with support? Well, there's, there's lots of different reasons for it, um, and I'm not going to get into all of that at this level, um, but it, it causes you know, a lot more work. Um, the gloss mode, basically, and there's a part up here, and again, I encourage you guys afterwards, whether it's here or out there, to come up, take a look at this part. Feel free to dig some support out of it. I brought a couple prison tools with me. 
<laughs> borrowed these from my brother. Oh, sorry. Um, dig these out of here, and you can have fun with this. I got napkins. It's not going to harm you. Um, but you can just get a feel for what that's all about. Um, that was built in the gloss mode, by the way. So the whole top surface is nice and shiny and gloss. If I'm running in matte mode, any level of degree beyond vertical, beyond 90, will require support. So in SLA, you know, I can get away with overhangs, no supports, self-supports. In PolyJet, once you go any, any, even a half degree, quarter degree, it doesn't matter what that level is, beyond 90, you need support. So when you're dealing with a part, an injection molded part, that has draft on it, bottom sides this way, top sides this way, bottom of your part has this matte finish, top, part, top side of your part has this gloss finish. So from an aesthetic standpoint, it doesn't look that well. Sometimes people go, huh, oh, what's up with the finish on this? You know, the underside's real rough, the top side's beautiful. So that's where we get into, well, we're gonna just start making parts in matte mode because then it's consistent. If nothing else, it's consistent. There's obvious reasons where you're not gonna do that. Injection mold tooling cavities. If you're gonna print one of them, everything is drafted for injection molding. It's drafted the opposite way. So it lends itself to gloss mode builds. It also lends itself to a nice smoother surface finish. Um, so that would help in, um, in that position. So the parts you're seeing up here, this part is starting to go through that clean out process. The top one is more cleaned out, the bottom one still has support material in there. When the PolyJet starts to support parts, it blends the support material with some percentage of part material. So if you're doing it, uh, a red uh, magenta in there and you're building a white part, the system will pick the magenta to blend with the support. So now it's easier for you to see the differential there. Because if I start building parts that are white and I'm using white supports, again, it makes it much more difficult to find, okay, what's support, what is part? So when you can transition it and have black supports with white part, it makes it much more obvious for the guys to know what needs to be removed. So this part was all built at the same time. Nice thing about PolyJet, you can do different colors, you can do different durometers, you can do all these things all in one build. You know, again, these are some of the tools of the trade. Little brushes, scalpels, a lot of the stuff comes from the dentist industry. I mean, we use dental tools all over the place. Um, maybe they should start heading after the additive industry for some of these tools. So they work really good. So, some other steps. Once the parts come off and they have this support material on there, we try to get as much off as we can by hand as much as we can, dig out the big chunks, get the big portions of it removed. Once that's done, we take the parts and we put them in an ultrasonic tank. Some places don't use ultrasonic, some people just put them in a Tupperware bucket. I mean, when I went for my training up in Belrica at Stratasys, they just had Tupperware buckets full of this solution. And again, this solution is a sodium hydroxide solution. It's not friendly stuff. It's not stuff you want to be playing around with or, or uh, dealing with if you don't have to. Um, and they had buckets of it just laying around. Um, I wanted to get a head start on that. I wanted to use some ultrasonics. I wanted to get as much of this material off. I want to get it into an ultrasonic tank, let the ultrasonics do its work, and really penetrate and remove this material faster, especially when you're getting into deep pockets, deep cavities, areas that are difficult to get at. After it comes out of the ultrasonic tank, then it goes in, and we, we actually formulate our own, our own version of the sodium hydroxide. Um, because we found, again, through user experience, different materials do differently with different levels of it. Um, some of the softer Tango flexible materials clean up nicer with higher levels. Some of them do better. Again, it's one of these situations, too long, warpage, distortion, too little, not enough. So again, there's no guidelines. It says every part goes in there for 10 minutes and it's done. This is all just knowledge from experience. Once it's out of there, we go into a water bead blaster. So this is a, uh, yeah, just a, a water station that comes out with pressure. It's basically a, a power washer hooked into a machine. 
put your rubber gloves in there. Now one thing that I find is that when the parts come out of the sodium hydroxide and they go into this blaster, for whatever reason they're very slippery. I mean they are incredibly hard to hold. And when you get some parts that are this big and you're working, I, I, I'm a little guy. These fireman gloves that are in there, I, I can't even feel my fingers in there and I'm supposed to hold a part that's a half an inch by half an inch and blast it with a power washer and hold on to it. So again, you know, we find all these tricks of how we can do it, ways we do it, ways we may have to avoid doing it. I mean, some of the parts never even go into there because it will destroy them. And when you're dealing with supports that are fully encompassing your part, and you take it in here and just start power washing it, you're going to start blasting off ribs, features, all kinds of things that you may not have even known was in there. So um, again, it's, it's, a, uh, it's an exercise. You know, this is that station there. You can see the rubber gloves in there. And actually, we have this little cage in there. I don't know if you can see that little cage at the bottom. It's a very fine mesh surface. And what we'll do is take little parts, put them in there, and then blast it. Try to get them cleaned up. But they can get really volatile in there. I mean, they'll get spinning. And they get, it's like, whoa, slow down. Open it up, the parts in 10 pieces. Oh, my god. Um, but we also know that when, when you start working with different materials, you know, the Vero line of materials, we know what, what that's like. That's like the old SLA. It's that acrylate based material, brittle, delicate. Um, so we'd be really careful when we're dealing with the Veros. When we start dealing with the blends, the digital ABS, beautiful. We could take it in there, we could blast it all day. We don't have to be so concerned about features. So we really favor those digital ABS materials uh, for a lot of different reasons. Then once it comes off, just compressed air, dry it. It's important to dry the parts. When these parts come off, you remember you're just pulling them out of a bead blaster, or uh, not a bead blaster, a water blaster. They're wet. Acrylites over the, over the years, that, that, that's a known material to absorb moisture and warp and swell and all these things you don't want to have happen. So it's real important to get these parts dry. We take them, when, when we're done with these, we have a room that's got dehumidifiers in it and controlled temperature. And when parts come off of here, they go in that room and then they really stabilize there before, before they go out. So going through all of this stuff, it's, you know, it's all about paying attention to the details. I mean, that's what it's all about when you're going through post-processing. There's no rules, there's no guidelines. Well, I guess there's guidelines, but you really have to, you really have to learn as you go with this stuff. And, and you know, people always say, well, you know, your service bureau, man, your parts are expensive. Why, why, I mean, why would I come to you for a part? I, I, can, I can do this on my, on my MakerBot over here for you know, a fraction of what you're charging. Are you out of your mind? And, and you know, this is what goes into it. This is what we have to explain to people. This is not print a part, here it is. You know, we're not, we're not an internal company. We're not, we're not TE making parts for internal people. We're a service bureau making parts for the rest of the world. We see lots of different geometries, lots of different parts, um, all sorts of things. When, it, when any of these, o, uh, the equipment OEMs want to learn anything about their machines, guess where they go? Service bureaus. Because they know we're running the gamut. We're not just running these parts or these parts or these type of parts. We're running medical, consumer, um, electronic. I, I can't even think of an industry that we don't deal with. I mean, we just started doing work with uh, Peeps. They make the marshmallow. And I'm thinking like, what, what, why would Peeps, what do they want with additive manufacturing? And um, it was really cool. We made some uh, conformance models for them because one of the problems that they had is that they'd take a perfect row of Peeps and this was the person on the line's job to make sure that the ones come down looked like that. Well, the real candy, guess how long it lasted? It didn't last long. People ate it. I don't know what they did with it, but they couldn't keep it around. So I said, oh, yeah, we could, we could make something like that up. That's no problem. They said, no, no, we don't, we don't want you to make something up. We're going to send you a row of peeps, a perfect row of peeps, what we idealize as a perfect row of peeps. And you're going to scan that, and you're going to create an STL file from that, and then we want you to build a yellow version of this model. 
and we've decided to build it on the polyjet, number one, because we can get the yellow, number two, because we can build it in an elastomeric blend. So I was built it at, I think, an 80A or 95A, so if it fell on the floor, doesn't, doesn't smash, it's going to stand the test of time, and you can look at it and say, you know, now the operators can stand there and use that. So, you know, when you start thinking about additive and you start saying, where, where can I use this? Why, you know, I'm not in that kind of work. I, I could never use this. But I find that every business that I go into, no matter what it is, no matter if it's making cupcakes, no matter if it's, you know, electronics, consumer products, wherever, there is, a, there is an application somewhere that you can find that utilizes this technology. That doesn't mean you need to go out and buy equipment. I mean, so please don't. Come to us. We'll make anything you want. <laughs> so I'm just going to finish up here. Um, you know, post-processing is the details behind additive manufacturing, industrial 3D printing. Excellence is in the details. Give attention to the details, and excellence will come. Um, that's kind of our, our mantra there. And uh, that's all I got. Go. When you have the uh, wet piece that you're air, air drying, have you tried vacuuming? Putting it in the vacuum uh, system? I know you can do that with, um, well, with FDM that works um, because it is a, a porous. Um, you know, it's not 100% dense, and you can do that with FDM. Polyjet is 100% dense, so there is no porosity when you're talking with Polyjet. Um, so Polyjet compressed air works well, and um, I mean, the FDM typically compressed air, throw it in the, with, in the room with the dehumidifier, works pretty well, works pretty well. I mean, there's some reasons why maybe you want, you know, like I said, there's trace levels of sodium hydroxide you know, sometimes that might react with a customer's whatever they're doing with it. So maybe you need to find out what they're doing with it, and then you can vacuum it and pull all those levels out with vacuum chambers. And, and we, have, uh, we have several vacuum chambers. Yeah. I mean, these are Renishaw. Uh, it's not uh, a handmade vacuum chamber. But Bob. Um, SLS. Print nylon, how does it compare in physical properties percentage to an injection molded? Uh, there's lots of studies done on that. Um, the, the one thing about SLS, and, and I think Brian had done some studies last year at AMUG showing the difference between. Did you do SLS on that? We didn't do SLS. Didn't do SLS. Um, oh, well, that was just comparing technologies anyway, not to injection mold it. Um, uh, but the one thing about SLS is that it, it's sensitive to where it's built on the platform. Um, it, it's, it's getting better um, with the newer systems. EOS has a thermal scan where they're scanning every layer to find out that heat dissipation across it. Because in the past, if you had a, a part built in this corner back here, it could have some majorly different properties than the part that's built right in the center. Um, so there's some things that, you know, over time is getting better. People are starting to realize this, understand this, and uh, making changes to the equipment. Um, in terms of how does it actually compare to an injection molded uh, nylon, I could find the answer. I don't know percentage-wise off the top of my head, but there's, there's lots of studies out there that show that. Maybe, maybe Bob might know that or somebody in the room might know that, but there are, there are some studies that have been done to compare that. But it's, it's pretty close. It's pretty close. Yep. Um, with, with SLS and let's say nylon in this case, do uh, you do like post-processing where you're either picking the part or trying to infuse it with some liquid to help increase its strength and seal it up? Yeah, there's 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 uh, infiltration processes that that can be done with SLS because SLS again it's a uh, you know it's kind of uh, porous to some degree, so um, some clients want to hold water, they want to fill something up, they don't want it to leak, they don't want it to swell. So they're uh, typically like, I hate saying the word cyanonacolite superglue. Um, you can use that. Um, people use that to seal it. Uh, again, we use a lot of two-part urethane clear coat and we spray it and that seals it real nice. 
Um, so not only does it seal it, it actually gives it a nicer surface finish and makes it sanding um, a lot better. Yeah? Have either ProtoCam or anyone ever done any studies to uh, look at the percentage of time you have in pre, and then you have in production, and then you have in post-production? Look, that seems onerous. What you're doing there. Yeah, the... 40 hours. The funny thing, the funny thing, uh, I mean, the funny thing about that, um, you know, when I, when I think about that question is that that one slide way back, I was standing near the parts, very big parts. So those parts, you know, that may have been a 40, 50 hour build, but those parts, those big parts like that, they'll go through our shop in four or five hours, done. Then I could take apart a tray of connectors that are this big by this big and in a 15 by 15 square I'm, I have 100 of them on there. Now that runtime was four hours. Four hours of runtime turns into the shop 40 hours. Now it's not that far but it's way more significant. So a lot of people will, will take the idea that well it's a small part you know, it's building. It takes two hours to build it. We can ship this today. Like, well, you yeah, know, we can build it in two hours, but we got to post-process that thing. And we got to be careful about, you know, you can, you can destroy it just as fast as you made it. So actually the little parts and the small delicate parts actually take more time than the big long runners. I mean, we love those big long runners for, for, for a lot of reasons. And um, it really, that stuff goes through our shop beautifully. I got to bring out the Bush's baked beans dog. You know that's our secret sauce. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's just experience. You know it's experience, and, and we've done things. We have algorithms. We have studies done. I mean we worked with actually Lehigh University graduate students and done time studies, different things like that too. You know really try to get closer. Um, and again, you know part of our thing is you know we're not shapeways. Um, you know, just a quick plug. We're not shapeways. We're not materialized. Um, we're not giving parts away for five dollars a piece, um, because I mean, everybody that when you call Protocam, you, somebody answers the phone. There's no, hey, get this number for Ed. And then when they answer the phone, they're going to get you to an engineer. Um, you do not talk to somebody who just, uh, yeah, well, this is what we can do. You're talking to an engineer, and that engineer is giving you valuable information. Um, number one, we're finding out what, what is your requirements for this part. You know, part orientation, which again would be another great topic to cover in the critical aspect of part orientation because there's a lot that goes into that as well. I mean, I can give you a really cheap part. I mean, a perfect example is a pen. Everybody looks at a pen. I mean, help. if I lay this thing down like that and build it, I can smoke through that in an hour. I'm done. But if I stand it up, it's taken eight hours. Well, why would I want to? Why, why would I want to pay so much more for this? Why would you ever stand it up? Well, with different technologies, if I'm talking about SLA, maybe this is a a needle, a hypodermic needle for a medical company, and there's a syringe, and things have to go in, and the concentricity of this pen is critical to what they're trying to determine. So SLA, I'm drawing rings, one on top of the other. This is a perfectly concentric part when it's done. If I took it and built it flat, which I could do, it's going to be completely out of round. Now stuff's not fitting right. Now things are having issues. I just had this scenario with a medical company just a week ago. And they said, oh, that's way too much. Why so much? I said, well, because I built it. I, I quoted this standing up, figuring you got a lot of critical fits in here. You're going to want to make sure stuff fits. Well, the purpose of what I'm doing with these, I don't really care about that. OK, I'll lay it down. I laid it down, he got the parts, he said, hey, none of this stuff's going together. <laughs> I said, I know. <laughs> I, I thought I kind of explained that to you, but you know, you wanted it for a lot less and, and get your sandpaper out and have fun. Um, so, you know, we, but we try, to, we try to get into, I mean, we can't, you know, talk to every single customer, but we really try to get into people's heads. I mean, when we see a, an RFQ come over, that we look at it and we look at what they're requesting, we go, 
Nah, this is not good. This is not good. And a lot of times we'll call them and say, hey, is there any reason why you picked Vero Black for this part? I don't know. I wanted a black part. I say, okay, but, but looking at this part, I mean, you got snap features, you got this. I could see what you're trying to do with this. Let me recommend something else for you. And then we'll go through that exercise. And, and you know, that's where we bring a lot of value added to these places. I mean, we don't, we don't quote on lowest Z. We don't quote on, I mean, we, we, we look at every part that comes, comes through ProtoCam, every single one an engineer looks at. Some of them are straightforward. I mean, it's great. You work with guys that are veterans of the industry, and they say, hey, I know exactly what I want. I don't need you to tell me what I want. I know what I want, and this is what, perfect. I love them. But we're dealing with a lot of people, just like here, that you know, they're not sure of it. I don't know. How do I know what technology I want? I have no idea. Do you want a cheap part? Do you want a functional part? Do you want an aesthetic part? What are you trying to do with it? Let me guide you. Let me direct you. That's what we're here for. That's why we have you know, everybody on our staff. I mean, our average, our average uh, tenure is, uh, I think, 12 years right now. 12 years is our average. We don't have turnover. We don't. Anybody else? Brian? I just kind of think about, you, know, you talked a lot about post-processing and the effort involved. Can you talk a little bit? You, you just sort of mentioned kind of the, the front end of things. Yeah. What does the pre-processing for you guys look like, and, and what kind of time is spent there? Yeah, I mean, pre-processing, um, you know, as the different technologies have come along, I think they've all done a good job at helping out with that. I mean, like PolyJet, for instance, like Bob mentioned earlier. I could set a PolyJet part up in three seconds. Throw it on the tray, matte gloss, go. SLA, the oldest technology, the one that started it all, is still the most challenging for setup. Because there's lots of things, I mean, you know, they'll tell you, go ahead, hit supports, generate supports, run it. You can do that, but if you want a good part, if you want to make sure you're not going to have a failure, if you want to remove certain supports that you know are not necessary, take that time and do it. Ron Belknap, who's the, the president CEO of Protocam, he physically sets up every build. He's intimately involved with the company. He's not just an owner. I mean, he sets up every single build. And when he's doing that, he looks at it, determines what shouldn't I put, what should I put, why do you have it oriented like this? Why don't you? I mean, we, we'll send them stuff back there that's like this. And he's going, what, what's the deal with this? Why are you doing that? And then, you know, we go through and explain it. Okay. Well, thank you.